So uh, a, lot of pe- a lot of people are familiar now with that um, strategy, which was launched softly four years ago, 2007. Um, but notice that the uh, open government information and data reuse movement is now really t- starting to take off. And that gives us a completely new framework for thinking about what we're doing. And this is <coughs> a movement that's happening in jurisdictions right around the world, opening up government information for reuse and all sorts of product- productivity improvements that come from that. So think of our geospatial strategy in that context now. What it comprises, our geospatial strategy has got four major pillars, four sets of goals around governance and data, accessibility and interoperability, which we're talking about this morning. So just a reminder that that's uh, why we're talking interoperability this morning. It's in that context. And uh, also a little bit more about our background. This, uh, this report, which came out in 2009, a couple of years after the uh, strategy was soft launched, um, has a really interesting comment in here. That had key barriers been removed, it's estimated that New Zealand could have benefited an additional $481 million per annum in productivity-related benefits in 2008, generating at least $100 million New Zealand dollars in revenue for the government. The cost of presence, the cost, this cost of presence of barriers will rise each year that passes as the nation's capacity to adopt is increasing continually and pent up demand is growing. So, you know, that's three years old coming on to that. So, um, we have to do something about getting information <coughs> out there and making it reusable. And notice this quote here from that particular report about data models, metadata standards, <coughs> and stacks of software. So I do intend to introduce you a little bit of that. Um, some of the reasons why this is important, you know, some recent conversations with people in the local government arena up in the Bay of Plenty have uh, told me that with a study they've done, maybe up to 70% of the typical GIS operator's time is spent just collecting, researching information, collecting it, manipulating it, trying to get it ready to work in their geographical information systems. That's an incredible percentage. When I was in Australia a few months ago, a senior scientist told me that before the science begins, up to 80% of the time of the senior, her senior science researchers, this was in the geosciences area, was spent trying to find the right information and confirming it. Before the real job began. Then we've got the numbers from the ASIL Tasman report about the value of spatial information to the New Zealand economy. Really big numbers. And there's just, just an alert that um, Kevin Sweeney has commissioned some more work. We might see some more evidence, more recent economic analysis coming out of Bill, which will be able to be revealed when that um, is um, matured a little bit. Um, there's also a story about capturing and applying knowledge that goes with this, with this story this morning. And probably really importantly, capturing workflow. That's what relates to those 70 and 80% sort of numbers, sorting out workflow. And this comes down to using technology really smartly. Um, if I go and have a look at industries outside of geospatial, go and, this, this is based on an American study of some years ago, 2007, um, construction and uh, facility type industries. Um, just look at the numbers. Just going to another completely different sector in, a, in another jurisdiction, another economy, but they're talking about the benefits of interoperability. Just look at the numbers, they're really impressive. Enormous savings to be made from interoperating. Look at the game. Um, another jurisdiction. But it's just, it's just to give a feeling for the sort of the, the big business case for taking this journey that we're, we're beginning. Um, something about Interoperability, because sometimes it's hard to explain what it is, but it might be sometimes um, easier to explain what it is if you don't have it. And some people are talking about these kinds of difficulties that they're having, that you can read off that slide there. Um, some of the typical problems 
related to getting new information and uh, getting it quickly and reliably and so on. And some of the sort of the, the complaint <coughs> sometimes floating about amongst various communities about getting, getting information. Because um, on the one hand, as individuals, we experience quite easy access to lots of rich and useful resources. And then we come to really important business-related resources and we find they're not so easy to access. And why is that? You know, we can go and use Google Earth at home and do fantastic things and come back to our businesses and find all sorts of difficulties trying to get the most reliable and quantitative <coughs> But, there's always a but, isn't there? And you know, there's a few geniuses who understand that um, sometimes um, the so-called simple and neat solution is not always right. And it's just a warning, really. Uh, we are dealing with a fairly complex problem with many dimensions. And we need to keep that in mind. And I like showing this one because this reminds me there's a, a zillion reasons why we need to do things differently. Um, here we are floating on this little satellite in the universe, and it's the only one we know. We've got some major issues to confront. But it reminds me also that it's good to think globally, but act locally. And that's particularly pertinent to the role that I'm fulfilling in standardization. Um, at a meeting with the minister yesterday, he was saying very clearly, don't reinvent the wheel. It's really important that we know that because there's a lot of effort that's gone on with hundreds of hundreds of years of um, effort to develop standards, and we can inherit a lot of that effort. <coughs> so now I can get down to, uh, we need a definition for interoperability, so we'll go into a little bit more <laughs> technical stuff. There it is, the capability to communicate, execute programs, or transfer data among various functional units in a manner that requires a user to have little or no knowledge of the unique characteristics of those units. So here's my, my, my units, my communication system. So uh, the reason I pulled these out, by the way, is because, um, sorry, because the, uh, it's actually, if anybody's read the metadata guide, they might have noticed the uh, what is baked bean can. But here's my uh, fibre network and my two units. Now, this particular example, I'm going to suggest it's not a good example of interoperability if we were to try and use it, because we know completely, don't we, what the two architectures are at either end of the network. And therefore I would say that's not going to be meeting our criteria with our definition of interoperability. I think we know all the characteristics of the units at both ends of the network, but maybe that's getting closer to the sort of thing we're where we don't actually know at all what's at the other end of the pipe or our fibre that we're sending uh, messages through. And another thing about the way we're doing things at the present time, sharing complex pieces of information. Um, on the left illustrates um, typically how we're doing things today. With, um, sharing stuff between known units, uh, using particular um, translators and file formats to do it. And with interoperability, open interoperability, where the information can be easily reused, maybe repurposed, there's a, there's a more efficient way to do it by using an agreed format that's used for every translation, translation of information between every component. This diagram here that illustrates how you'd have lots of different translations happening in an environment like that. And it's typically what happens now, though some of them are standardized. Over on the right is a bit of a utopia, but it illustrates how we only need one translator per system. Just think of those sort of efficiency gains that I was alluding to before. That tries to illustrate where we might get some savings. Um, and furthermore, for technical folk, those who know about some of the um, formats that are used at the present time. The chart just simply illustrates that um, a file format known as shapefile only transfers a little bit of the information that's actually known by the person sending the, sending the 